let's get back to um, the presentation. And we've talked about leadership, and we're in the middle of talking about particularity. Uh, I just gave the example of a farmer with different plots of land. But now I want to turn your attention to this admittedly very long quote, but I wouldn't put such a big quote in front of you if I didn't think it was worth it, and also that if I didn't think it was worth buying the book. Um, this is a quote from The Morality of Everyday Life. So obviously very focused in on particularity. Uh, we would maybe say casuistry. And this is by Thomas Fleming. He's a uh, political commentator, political and cultural commentator, longtime uh, chief editor of Chronicles. If you've heard of Chronicles before, uh, the magazine and the Institute, the Rockford Institute. Now he's doing his own thing uh, with the Fleming Foundation. But this book was written back, I believe, in 2000, early 2000s. But I really encourage you to buy the book. So this is from uh, the, the early uh, introduction or you know, first part of the book. And he's speaking against, describing and then speaking against the liberal consensus. And to put it in terms that I'm, I've been using, it's lack of sensitivity to particularity. There is a strange convergence in the style of reasoning employed by international philanthropists, liberal do-gooders, and right-to-life activists. Now, again, he's pro-life. He's a Christian. But he's talking about the way they reason. And this is the way that he is critiquing. That our obligation to do right, they tell us, does not come out of the peculiar circumstances of being a mother or a Christian or a Jew, but from philosophical or theological commitment to a global responsibility, as determined by a rational individual who considers the matter objectively and keeps his attention not on things as they are and have been, but on how they ought to be in an ideal world. He's going after ideologues. Universality, rationality, individualism, objectivity, and abstract idealism. These, in fact, are the hallmarks of the modern, that is, since the 17th century, ethical tradition, which, for the sake of convenience, I'm calling liberalism. The liberal perspective is far-sighted in both senses of the term. Liberals, in freeing themselves from the shackles of particular circumstances and traditions, attempt to take the long view of human life, and its possibilities. However, in keeping their eyes fixed upon the perfect sun setting beneath an ever receding horizon, they are apt to ignore the little things that may be just under their noses. Such moral and political idealism can produce brilliant utopian theories, such as Plato's Republic, as we were talking about during the break, and Moore's Utopia. But it can often lead to an indifference toward everyday life. Although Americans are not the first or only Europeans to yearn for an ideal social order, they may be the first to have been so na na naive as to think they could build utopia out of the ordinary building materials used to construct a shopping mall or suburban development. Good old American know-how and Yankee can-do attitude seem inevitably to produce a sterile idealism that is abstract without being noble, banal without having the charm of provincialism. Liberalism has been correctly described as, quote, the political theory of modernity, end quote. Some postmodern intellectuals have criticized the liberal consensus, but few of them have been prepared to abandon the tradition, much less to seek alternatives in the pre-modern traditions. Human societies are, it goes without saying, diverse in morals, no less than in manners. However, on certain points, such as the need for a social order, the importance of the family as an institution for rearing children, and the significance of kinship and friendship, there is a convergence, not only among the civilizations of the ancient world, but also with the enduring peasant morality that lies just beneath the surface of modern life. And this, I would note, is why so many times your quote-unquote common man has better instincts on some of these big questions than an expert or an ideologue. In fact, Aristotle and St. Thomas, to say nothing of Moses and St. Paul, are far closer in spirit and outlook to the common sense of ordinary people 
than they are to the thought of most modern philosophers. The ancient traditions, pagan, Judaic, and Christian, provide a realistic alternative that bears remarkable affinities with non-Western, that is, Chinese, African, Native American traditions. The distinction, however, and this is an important note, is not purely ancient versus modern. Stoics and Epicureans, and even Plato, furnished many weapons to modern liberals, while Hume and Nietzsche, among others, were highly critical of central planks in the liberal platform. Here is the end of the quote. If anything separates these other traditions from modern rationalism, it is their emphasis on what Jefferson deplored as, quote, the wretched depravity of particular duties, end quote. Where Descartes or Locke looked at the everyday world and saw nothing but a few universal rules, reducible to a mathematical formula, Aristotle and the writers of the Old Testament discerned an intricate network of peculiar obligations arising from specific circumstances and experiences. Where modern philosophers from Kant to Kohlberg regard a mother's self-sacrificing love for her children as beneath the level of morality, just, you know, kind of despises just a natural thing, folk wisdom tells us it is nearly the highest morality, taking precedence over the duties of citizenship or the claims of humanity. In the modern theories, moral conflicts can almost always be resolved into a choice between right and wrong, between human rights and oppression. The older tradition was more complex. A soldier might owe loyalty to his commander and nation, but also have conflicting duties to his family and his church. He might be forced to choose between obeying orders or obeying his conscience, between staying with his unit or returning home to save his family from distress. And what Thomas Fleming is talking about that we Lutherans should be talking about is, of course, casuistry and the framework of all of those overlapping, intricate duties. The three estates. That's the framework. The framework that we have is more complex. We have a tradition that goes far back beyond and before Enlightenment idealism and quote unquote rationality that helped, you know, have the unified or deified state arise. But we should not think of a unified state and deify it, but rather we should think of the estates, plural. Our framework, our worldview, I know that's kind of a, that, that's been what, a hot word for the last couple decades. If we Lutherans have a worldview, a framework, it's the three hierarchies the three estates, how God has instituted and set up rule and order in the world. Why? Because the three hierarchies, number one, teach us the order of God's creation. They tell us who we are to be and what we are to do. And last but not least, they give us firm footing concerning our duties, roles, and our authority. That's so important, having firm footing. It is one thing to diagnose a problem, to say totalitarianism must be wrong. It obviously is wrong, but then you have to have an alternative. What would be a good example of uh, someone who physically needs really, really firm footing to get the job done? Any examples? When, what's that? Hit a baseball. Hit a baseball? Yeah, you better have that back foot not moving around. I can think of a better sports example. Golf, darts. Golfer, darts. It all comes back to darts. You're going to tell us you need another sabbatical next, right? You know? I, I, I can think of a better example. An offensive line. I remember uh, uh, in, in college, I would play pickup tackle football every Saturday. And I remember uh, uh, one guy who was in our class, he went to the college, he... Uh, he, uh, you know, got some of his old high school buddies to come out and play us, and uh, we got wiped out. It's not because they were bigger and stronger. It was because, guess what they had and we didn't? Not training. They, I mean, they did have more of that, too. Cleats. That was it, because we were playing in the snow. And I remember lining up against the guy, thinking, oh, I'm going to tear him to pieces. It didn't matter. I just pushed and pushed and slid. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> 
I knew what the right thing was to do, right? And, and this is kind of my point. This is why I wanted to illustrate it with the offensive line. I knew what I needed to do. I needed to push him harder. I needed to move his arms around, throw him down, push, push, push. But because I didn't have firm footing, it didn't matter what I knew. It didn't matter my training. It didn't matter anything because I didn't have something firm to dig into, something particular. And that's what the Three Estates is all about. We should think about these guys, the Black and Blue Brothers, back from the uh, glory days. But I don't watch the NFL anymore, so who cares? <laughs> so let's get into uh, part two. Uh, but before, any questions about that Fleming quote? Or was it pretty self-explanatory? Okay, let's keep going. The three hierarchies. So um, God's earthly rule and institutions. I assume everyone has heard about the two kingdoms, sometimes called two governments, two realms, ecclesiastical and civil governance. But what is far more fundamental in Lutheran thinking, this is true of Luther, and it's also true of the Lutheran tradition, is the three hierarchies or the three estates. I'll be using hierarchies and estates interchangeably. And those three estates are the home, the church, and civil government. Oswald Bayer compares each organization, organizing framework, comparing the two kingdoms and the three hierarchies in this way. The teaching about the two realms, Luther thinks about this as a critical distinction. So I'm not saying get rid of the two kingdoms. God deals in each realm in a different way. Yet when Luther explains the three estates, he presents a positive arrangement. And this means something that can be built upon and expanded, and in many ways is much more practical and useful um, in day-to-day -day life. It is always God who works in each person in all three estates within the world, in that its existence is rooted in paradise and will not be voided, even in the eschaton, but will be fulfilled. I mean, the three estates are there in creation. Uh, Luther famously said that Adam was what? He was father, he was high priest, and he was Kaiser, emperor, the king, all at the same time. Also, the understanding of the three estates runs through our small and large catechism. So let's start at the fourth commandment. It's a natural place to go. What is the fourth commandment? Thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long upon the earth. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, that we may not despise our parents and masters, nor provoke them to anger, but give them honor, serve and obey them, and hold them in love and esteem. Notice it's not just parents uh, exclusively, but of course, other rulers, other masters. What's the new translation? Other authorities? Is that what it is? Now, the large catechism has a lot more to say about this. In this commandment belongs a further statement regarding all kinds of obedience to persons in authority who have to command and to govern. For all authority flows and is propagated from the authority of parents. So there's a particular relationship uh, within those three estates. All of whom we call masters are in the place of parents and must derive their power and authority to govern from them. And so they're also called fathers. And thus, Luther also applies it in the second quote uh, to obedience to civil government. Uh, because it's all embraced in the estate of fatherhood and extends farthest of all relations. For here the father is not one of a single family, but of as many people as he has tenants, citizens, or subjects. Thus we have two kinds of fathers presented in this commandment. Fathers in blood, that would be coordinated with the home. And fathers in office, that would be coordinated with the, the fathers of the nation, fathers in civil government. And yet there's also a third category of fathers, or those, uh, excuse me, besides these, there are yet spiritual fathers. Not like those crummy spiritual fathers in the papacy, Luther's pointing out, um, but rather one who function in the paternal office. Uh, for those only are called spiritual fathers who govern and guide us by the word of God. Further uh, evidence of this in the large catechism. For he, God, does not wish to have in this office and government knaves and tyrants. So Luther does talk about tyranny right here in the large catechism. Nor does he assign to them this honor that is power and authority to govern that they should have themselves worshipped. That's not the point of him setting up these fathers. But they should consider that they are under obligations of obedience to God 
and that first of all, they should earnestly and faithfully discharge their office, not only in support and provide for the bodily necessities of the children, servants, subjects, etc., but most of all, to train them to the honor and praise of God. Therefore, now he's speaking to these fathers. Therefore, do not think that this is left to your pleasure and arbitrary will, but that it is a strict command and injunction of God to whom also you must give account for it. So it's not just that fathers, whether it be in the home or in the church or in the civil government, are given authority, but also there is coordinate duty and obligations that they have uh, to those that they are to be paternal toward. There's a critical distinction also when we think about the three hierarchies, and that is person versus office, or if you want to put it into the German, Christperson versus Weltperson. Uh, a Christian person, a Christ person uh, versus a person who lives in the world. Not a worldly person like a sinner, right? You know what I mean? But someone who lives in the world. And this is a very uh, critical distinction and it's self-evident, uh, such as uh, the distinction between an office uh, like father and the one who holds the office. God has instituted and he has defined his offices. So there's a distinction between person and office. And that's important because when we think about authority and authority overreaching, we have to make that distinction between the office and its uh, intrinsic duties or given duties versus the person who is inhabiting it and his uh, particular behavior. And then there's that other distinction uh, that is as critical as well. Um, so as a Christian, as a, a Christ person, a Christ person, we have everything, right? Luther talks about this uh, very frequently. You know, as a Christian, I have everything. I have no need for what? Vengeance or justice even or anything like that. I've already got everything in Christ. Christ has given me himself, the one thing needful. So a Christian as a Christian has no need for defense because he's got everything. It doesn't matter if they kill you, right? Don't fear the one who can kill the body, but the one who can destroy the soul. Fear God alone. Even if you're martyred, you still have Christ. But we are Christians in the world, which means that we also hold certain offices. No matter whether we're the lowliest slave or the highest king or emperor, we do have offices in all of those three estates. And so as a person who lives in this world, we should understand that we've been placed into particular offices and thus have particular duties towards God and my neighbor. So even if I don't need to resist a tyrannical order because I'm scared of forgiveness being taken away, I might consider doing that as a father, as a lesser magistrate, as a pastor, because I'm in an office and I have particular duties to real flesh and uh, blood human beings that are under my care. So this gets us to the question that uh, is very important when, when we consider resistance to tyranny. Who is to act? In what way? In which sphere or particular place? Well, the answer within the framework of the three estates is, well, each according to his station. It depends. It depends on what your office is. It depends on the circumstances. It depends on what the order is and who's giving it. Now, um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but just to draw your attention to the table of duties, probably the most underutilized section of the catechism, typically not, uh, you know, forced to be uh, memorized by uh, confirmation students, but the three estates runs through the table of duties. Who are you in the church? Well, either you're a preacher or a hearer. In the civil government, either you are a magistrate or a subject. We might say citizen, but I kind of think we might be subjects at this point. In the home, now that's where the most time and attention is paid to it because the vast majority of our time here in the world is spent being what? A father, a mother, a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife. Um, also economic activity is placed under the home, not under the civil government. Okay, um, let's keep going. I want to also draw your attention to another place where the three estates comes up in the small catechism that um, the, the pastors who have it memorized and I, well, everyone has it memorized, right? We're all, we're all confirmed here. So the pastors may have this memorized, 
But I would hazard a guess that some of you haven't thought about it in terms of the three estates before. This is under uh, the fifth chief part with confession. When considering which sins we ought to confess, the small catechism teaches us to, let's do it slowly, here consider your station according the, to the Ten Commandments. I would hazard a guess that your first instinct as a pastor or as a layman is that when you are considering your sins, what would you go to first? What's that? Husband. Right. Well, okay. So you're giving the answer that I want to say isn't the natural one. So no, that's fine. Ten commandments, right? Because that's what we drill into people's heads, right? That w that's what teaches us what's right or wrong. But here in the catechism, it does that. It's not just let's consider the Ten Commandments abstractly, but let's consider the Ten Commandments as a husband, as a wife, as a mother, as a father, as a child. And that's exactly uh, what the, the catechism teaches us. So, uh, and notice that consider your station comes first. I think that's very purposeful. Consider your station, who you are, what you are to do particularly, and that's going to help shape how you see where you measure up and where you don't measure up concerning each one of the commandments. So um, what does this bring us to? Well, our knowledge of the three hierarchies should be coupled, and it is so done in the small catechism. So the three hierarchies, our stations, coupled with the Ten Commandments, give us binocular vision. Why, when uh, Peterson is not playing softball, can he catch you? Well, wh why can you throw darts relatively well? Because you have binocular vision. If you only had, I mean, guys who play with one eye, you don't have depth perception, right? Your eyes just being separated by a few inches gives you 3D imaging. I mean, that, that's why we have two eyes. So, so, so we have binocular vision. And that's the same way I, I'd like to use that example with uh, the three hierarchies and the Ten Commandments. Instead of just kind of an abstract, there's the Ten Commandments, here's our stations. Rather, you put them together to get a 3D image of your duties and your obligations and all of the ways that you failed in them or what you positively should do. So it gives us 3D vision so we can look through the proper lenses when we evaluate what our particular duties are and what good works God would have us do. So it's actually these slides why I made a PowerPoint, because I think it's helpful to actually visually look at this and have it in our minds, not just thinking about it in our heads, about how these three hierarchies aren't just distinct, but they have overlapping concerns and duties. So this isn't quite a Venn diagram. I guess it's a tri-Venn diagram. Is there a, a technical word for that or no? Be an oiler circle. A what? Euler's circle. Euler's circles. Okay. E-U-L-E-R. Oh, like a name? Right. Okay. So um, these three institutions of God, have, they, they do. They have overlapping spheres of concern and authority. Though there are, and this gets back to the clear and the hard cases and why we have to have the principles down first. So are there clear and hard cases? Are there general versus exceptional situations? Yes, of course there are. But that doesn't erase the fact that there are distinctions and there's general truths. And that all of these authorities are by definition, by definition, limited by God and in relation to one another. The fact that there is an estate of the church by definition means that it is distinct. And even if there's fuzzy stuff and overlapping concerns, that there is a distinction between it and civil government and it and the home. So by the fact of their existence means that there's going to be distinctions. So what would be some things that would be, let, let, let's use clear cases first. What would be some clear cases where the civil government has the, the, the biggest press, pressing duty? Taxation. Taxation, yeah. <laughs> Defense of the country, I heard war, same difference. Okay. What about the church? What would be some very clear things where the church has the primary, if not exclusive, uh, authority and obligation to, to do? Yeah, yeah, public worship, just to 
Yeah, the sacraments. Yeah, who, who else? Preach the gospel. Yeah, well, I would say public preaching, right? Public preaching. Okay, what about the home? Raising children. Yeah. What's that? Virtue? Yeah, I think, I think all of them are going to be involved in that. Let's get really particular about a task, right? Because we could say different, all of those institutions are to inculcate virtue in different ways, right? So let's think about a task. Training the children in the word. Even there, we're starting to get fuzzier, right? Because, because, the, because the church is to help assist. But yeah, the primary, because who's the catechism directed to primarily? The house father, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think when you're in the home, you're you're teaching some things to the children kind of by osmosis or, in, or uh, implication because, you know, the father and the mother give orders and make order for their home. Yeah. They don't teach that they are the authorities. They just are. And the kids, when they have parents that are willing to do that and understand that, yeah. will then learn by osmosis that, oh, there's order. Yeah, and you use the word natural, which goes to the point that, Luther was making that the, the home is the foundational estate just by nature. I mean, hearers of the word don't pop out of, you know, the sky. Citizens don't just magically appear. They're, they're birthed, right? But more specifically, feeding children, putting a roof yeah, over yep. them. Yeah, yeah, the care of particular children. And we can see how uh, we say that and we go, who's usurping that already, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, we would say the church can do works of mercy, especially for the family of faith. So again, the, these aren't absolutely exclusive, but who has the primary responsibility? The actual parents. So let's see if you got all of mine. I, it's small, so I couldn't make it any bigger. Sorry. So I, I put for civil government, national and local for local jurisdictions, uh, like peace officers, defense, raising armies, making and ministering laws, minting money, conducting foreign policy, the church, congregational worship, public preaching, administration, of the sacraments. And then for the home, I put as the default or creationally foundational estate, all domestic, because it's the default, right? It's the default. All domestic and familial activities, raising children, pursuing economic or business enterprises, maintaining and improving familial property, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I've never thought about this this way before, but when you were trying to come up with it, it seems as though we could find things in the church and in the civil government that are, that are actually exclusive. But everything that the family does, it seems like is underneath the church and the government. So we, I can't think of anything that the family does that the church doesn't care about or the government doesn't care about. So if I could change your language just slightly, um, uh, that 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 the state I, because you said it's under but i would actually say it's supported by right yeah i'm I, the home's not over those other two estates they each have their distinct spheres but not just biologically or creationally it's foundational but also what's in service to what sure. i mean we have to recognize the home as the primary estate so but so, so in other but then nothing happens in the home that isn't directly related to at least four. Oh. Yep, so, so nothing really happened. That should really only be two circles. Because it should only be church and government. And then and then the whole thing is the family. Well, I mean, I mean because there's just, I mean, I, I don't, this is, a, I'm just thinking this right sure, now. Yeah. But I can't think of anything that is absolutely distinct to the family, right? That the government, right? If, if you don't feed your children, the government should care because it has, it has an obligation. If, the, if, if you don't train your children, the government should care. Well, so, so instead, of, in, instead of saying there should only be two circles and one big circle of the home, I would say there should be one huge circle of the home and then two little overlapping circles on the edge of the civil government and the church, frankly. So what's, is there anything utterly unique to the home? Procreation. Yeah. And the government cares a lot about that. Yeah. Um, and so does the, I mean, in terms of we need citizens, I need soldiers, yeah. I need workers. So. Well, and that's why there's always overlapping concerns. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is that the, the civil government and the, the, the church come out biologically from the home. 
So I, I, as long as we understand that that's the foundational estate and the others are in service, that, that I think makes a lot of sense. Because I mean, in some ways, to, to rephrase it, everything that you would do in the home, I mean, you said the home doesn't have anything particular. I would say the government and the church don't have anything particular that isn't just what already should happen in the home, just on a more public bigger scale. So that kind of goes both ways, I guess. Job can offer his own sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. Abraham makes war. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Abraham preaches, right? Public preaching. The only reason why it gets more complex and a little bit more separated or distinct is because there's literally more people, you know? It's not until you have Israel as a nation do you have a distinction between I mean, the high priest Aaron and Moses, who's the political ruler and the prophet. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, like Abraham, just like Adam, is father, high priest, and Kaiser over his little tribe, you know? So I think that, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it goes both ways. So that's the, uh, that's the clear cases. Or now we're moving towards the, I mean, you're bringing us closer to... Yeah, fuzzy issues. Now, so here, here's the next slide. Different roles concerning the same issue, which Peterson already brought us to. So worship uh, in the civil government, earthly defense of the church, punishment of public blasphemy. That's a hobby horse of mine that we won't get into. But uh, historically, historically, that was understood as the church's role. But that's a discussion for another day. Uh, uh, so we should have started with the home, worship, family altar, health as two examples, right? Worship, family altar, health, uh, familial health. So we start there, civil government, uh, defense of the church, punishment of public blasphemy, and then health. Does the government have a, a legitimate interest in health? Yeah, public health, sure. Uh, also the church, public congregational worship. You know, uh, the, the, the church is going to regulate that. And then health. Well, you could spiritualize it and say spiritual health, but also a special concern for the family of faith and even by extension, all neighbors, works of mercy. So even you don't have to just spiritualize it. You could say, is the church concerned with physical health? Well, do you visit shut-ins? Do, do, does the pastor say prayers, especially for those who are sick? Absolutely. Okay, so th those are different roles concerning the same issue. But of course... It gets more complicated. And, and, and again, this is why I wanted a PowerPoint so that uh, you guys all know the color wheel, right? No? Okay. <laughs> so if, if you take those primary colors, when two primary colors hit, you get another color. But you throw all of them together, it gets pretty brown. And I would say muddy. <laughs> the more overlapping estate concerns, the muddier it's going to to get, or at least the, the trickier and more careful you're gonna have to be. So overlapping concerns complicate matters. Let's think about things that, uh, that are in those places where the whatever circle Broughton's talking about overlap. Um, let's think about the home and <clears throat> the civil government. So we talked about war and national defense and local defense. Certainly the government has primary responsibility at those levels. But whose duty is it to lay down his life and kill invaders or intruders to personal property? The father, the father. You know, that's his by natural law. It's not given to us by the government. It's built into nature. So physical protection is actually an overlapping concern. And later on in, in another segment, we'll talk about, uh, you know, how we should really understand that, that a monopoly on violence is not actually a, an ideal, that the state has the monopoly on violence. Yeah. I'm getting a little bit derailed because I was thinking of something else. When, when you brought up the, the uh, idea from Luther that all authority in all three estates are derived from the home, well, that doesn't mean they're subservient to the home. No. So exactly what does it mean? Yeah, we will get into this more later. So I'll just give a very short answer. So when, when I was responding to Peterson's point about 
how everything that's done in the home is also in some ways a concern of these other estates. Um, I said th those other states serve the home, but not are subservient to. I, yeah, yeah, they, they, they aren't subservient to, nor as I'll talk a lot more about later, uh, at least in Lutheran thought, that it is not necessary for the, for, for the governed to give their consent. Be because this is paternal authority, like, like a, the father has authority over his children, whether they have consented or not. I mean, a baby can't give consent anyway to that. But so, uh, however, that, you go ahead with your question. I'm not sure where you're going. What does it mean to say that all authority is derived from the home? Because it is an, it, it is an out, and, 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 and not outpouring, but it is a, it is a development from the fathers. This is true biologically, well, we would say creationally, but also it's true historically. I mean, Adam starts out as the father, but also the king. But as then you have six generations under you. So the one who's ruling is what? He's the clan patriarch or the tribal patriarch. And so as I'll talk about later, it's kind of a sliding scale. So it's naturally derived from that. Even the church because Abraham is the high priest. I mean, the, the, the father is the high priest of his family. You know, we believe in the priesthood of all believers, right? Yeah, uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> but in that sense, in a three estate sense, we do, right? So, okay. Um, so let's look at these overlapping concerns. So we did physical protection, training in the word of God. We already kind of covered this, right? The catechism may first and foremost be uh, spoken to parents, specifically the head of the household, the house father, but also the church is going to aid and assist. Um, also, there's overlapping stuff between the civil government and the church, shaping morality. I mean, there are some uh, conservatives who would say the government shouldn't shape morality. Well, of course it should. Don't steal is morality. You know, it's public outward morality. Um, leading the people. Well, leading is going to be done uh, on, a, on, on a public, national, and even local level by church leaders and the civil government. And then right in the middle, marriage and education. First and foremost, um, it, it, this is a household concern. Uh, back in the good old days, what did you have to have before you got married? What? Even, even older. You still have to have a marriage license, right? So that's consent of the government, right? Consent of the, consent of the father. That you had to have the consent of the parents. And ideally, if you look at Isaac and Rebecca, the consent of both sets of parents, specifically the father, right? You know? So, uh, so marriage, first and foremost, and I'll talk more about how Luther and his stuff on marriage really really points towards the family on this, but also education. D does the civil government have a legitimate interest in education? Yeah, we need citizens. As Luther would say, send those kids to school. We got to have doctors and lawyers and rulers and all this kind of stuff. Um, and does the church care about education? Well, you're holding a conference, right? You know, so yes. So, so there's overlapping concerns. This is just a very brief point, but an important one, I think. Uh, and that's the example of the shoreline. Uh, and that is fuzzy lines do not destroy all clarity or solid footing. Just because there may be hard cases and exceptional circumstances doesn't mean, and this gets back to your point, that there isn't a point about there's principles. So think about walking down the shore, you know, very romantic. You and your wife, you and your husband, right? You're walking along the shore. And where do you want to be if it's a nice day? What? Right on, the edge. right on the edge. So you're walking along and the waves are lapping up over your feet. Are you walking in the ocean or are you walking on land? Both. Different ones at different times. So let's just acknowledge there's going to be places where things are a little fuzzy, where overlapping concerns may make us take a very hard look at how we casuistically figure out who should do what, when, where, and how. But also let's understand that just because you might be walking along with your spouse 
and you, you, you say the word shore precisely because it's not fish or fowl. It's not very clearly water or very clearly land. But if you went 30 feet in either direction, what could you say with absolute certainty? I'm on the land. I'm in the water. I'm waiting in the lake or in the ocean. And so just because there's overlapping concerns and fuzzy lines sometimes doesn't mean that all clarity is lost. And, and, and I think that's a really important point because some people with Romans 13 will say things like, well, if you allow these exceptions, um, it'll be utter chaos, right? Just because you can't mathematically plot a line on when you obey and when you don't means there's nothing we can say about anything. Just obey, obey, obey. That, that's really a childish argument. And we should think of the shoreline, shoreline for that. So the rule exceptions and conflict. So when you are trying to figure out things that are very difficult, when you're talking about the rule or the principle, and then also acknowledging that there's exceptions, um, this is ripe for conflict, right? When people have overlapping concerns, they're going to argue over which concern should be held up the highest and what plan of action should be taken. So things go smoothly when what? Issues that arise that obviously fall under particular jurisdictions, like those easy ones we had. Who should regulate public worship? Well, it's the church. This is pretty easy. Precedent and tradition help guide and shape responses. What have we done in the past? Well, we've, we've done this, we've done that. You know, when there's clear precedent, usually new situations uh, that, can, that you can look back at the past, that helps out a lot. And also, in, in some ways, most important, reasonable people hold the offices of authority. To use a brief example, um, uh, in Wisconsin, uh, we had, uh, you, you know, the, the reaction to Ronatide was at first not being shut down like here in Illinois. We never got totally shut down. We were slapped with a 10-person limit. And while I personally thought that that was too extreme, because the Wisconsin government, um, it, was government it was Governor Evers, and even though he was very Rona crazy, uh, he was pressured by other groups, long story, into not shutting everything down, which it seemed like he wanted to do. But he, he allowed a 10-person rule, specifically churches were named. And because the government, whether it wanted to or not, was being more reasonable than the vast majority of the rest of the country, especially right across the border here in Illinois, we uh, as a circuit said, well, we're going to try and abide by this by and large. Now, does that mean if somebody walked in and it was number 11, get out of here? No, no, we weren't going to do that because we believe this was under our jurisdiction. But because the government was not, uh, well, at least was being a little reasonable, we said, hey, if they're being reasonable, what do I want to show back? I'm going to be reasonable. Hopefully we can come to something that works. And so our church did abide by the 10 person rule by and large. And so we had a million services every Sunday. Um, but I think that that's a lot. Uh, but, but then later on, when we knew that the Rona was not the bu bubonic plague or the black death and Racine uh, County wanted to slap or rather it was Governor Evers too, wanted to slap a mask order on us. We said, this is ridiculous. We already know enough facts to say that this is not something that's necessary. You have not met the burden of proof to show why you need to intrude into our business. So while you were being reasonable, we were going to try and be reasonable too. But now that you're doing this absurd thing, nope, not going to happen. Yeah. On your one of your previous diagrams, when you had that the civil government... Uh, does have a care about shaping morality. I couldn't help but think about how the um, the statement, just obey, just obey, just obey, many times plays out in a confusion between uh, morality and legality. In other words, sometimes morality and legality line up, yeah. but many times they don't. Right. And so the it seems like in practice then, that's the some many times the confusion is oh well, this is the law, so therefore we just need to. Open. Yeah, legality and morality just collapse. If it's legal, it's moral. If it's illegal, it's immoral. I mean, and we see this distinction even in the Old Testament, right? 
It's because of the hardness of your heart, right? That Moses had all of these immoral exceptions for divorce, you know? Yeah, very good point, because that was collapsed. And I think that in terms of uh, deifying the state leads to confusing the morality and the legality. I think those go hand in hand. So um, things go smoothly in those circumstances. What about exceptional circumstances? Well, in exceptional or extraordinary situations, as well as unreasonable or wicked authorities, uh, this raises the probability of some things. Uncertainty. What should we do? Because it's a crazy situation we've never faced or because people are acting very unreasonably. Um, also, this raises the probability of foolish, unwarranted or evil responses and conflict within an estate or between the estates. I mean, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. And so it's hard enough to go through a tough time. We see this within an estate, in our homes, right? Your family goes through a hard time. Uh, the father loses his job. The mother falls ill with cancer. Um, the kids are doing horrible in school. Uh, the, you know, whatever the situation may be, it's hard enough to get along in one of those situations. And so what do you got to do? Let's calm down. Let's be reasonable. So when there's this external pressure or internal pressure, uh, it's easy to go off the rails. Okay. We've, we've touched upon this already uh, today. But let's, let's look at it a little bit more, con uh, more specifically. Two concepts, burden of proof and competency. Two concepts that we have to have right when there are overlapping concerns and when, there is, uh, when it's very ripe for conflict. Uh, first, when there is conflict over authority or which orders to follow, two important questions arise. Who must sta satisfy the burden of proof? Kind of like when you uh, are uh, in, in debate. I was never in debate, but... You, you've all seen debates, right? Like for debate team or people argue. But what's important to establish in a technical debate situation is what? First and foremost, who's pro and who's con? Which means someone has to be arguing from the position of the status quo, right? You're not starting in the middle of nowhere abstractly. You're starting, this is the status quo. And then we want to change the status quo. And that's very similar to the issue of the burden of proof. Who must satisfy the burden of proof? And also, another related question, who has competency to judge in such a matter? So when we consider these two things, we got to especially understand the distinction between general and exceptional circumstances and fervently play, pray that reasonableness be maintained. But the burden of proof naturally and logically falls upon the one claiming an exception, right? I know, mom, that you said I was forbidden to go outside today because I'm grounded, but Johnny called me up and this is the only time we get to go see this movie. Well, that's an exception to the rule. Who has the burden of proof? Does the mother have to show why this should not be? No, the onus is upon whom? The child, right? Not just because it's a mother and a child, but because the status quo, the general rule is you're grounded. That's it. So the burden of proof naturally and logically falls upon the one claiming an exception and or the necessity of taking on authority. This is why I said earlier, the burden of proof, uh, when, uh, when a governmental official says you need to shut down, I'm not disrespecting his authority or even denying that he has legitimate interest in public health and safety to say, okay, but normally we can all agree who regulates worship, who decides when the services will be held. The church does. And so you, by stepping in, are, are trying to make an exception, which means who's the burden of proof on? Him, not me. I mean, a lot of people I think had that screwed up at the very early stages. Well, we've got to prove that that, that we can stay open. No, 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 no. The government has to prove that they are overstepping their bounds and, and they, need to, they need to meet that burden of proof that this is a legitimate exception. I threw out a couple uh, earlier, you know, if you're in Dresden in 1940, whatever, and the, 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 the local government says, you Christians, you Lutherans can't meet together because 
the Allied bombers are going to see 25 people or 100 people together and blow you to smithereens. We're making it. That's reasonable, actually. I think they've satisfied the burden of proof. I think that if a local government says there's a wildfire rushing through, it should it, it should hit us at midnight on Saturday. Cancel church and please send an email out to all your members to get in their cars and evacuate. I think that meets the burden of proof. But also, if, if, if someone who's overstepping their bounds, their, their normal bounds of authority, it, the, the burden of proof is not just upon them, but the proof should be so obvious that they probably don't even have to issue a very forcible command. It should be almost a request or an appeal that everyone goes, yeah, absolutely, there's a wildfire, I'm out of here. Uh, think about the Spanish flu. The government didn't have to issue tyrannical orders to the churches. They said, hey, please don't meet for this time in this place, in this locale. And the churches, by and large, respected those requests. A, because they were requests, and B, because 4% of everyone who got the Spanish flu died. They could see with their eyes that this was not discriminating at near as much as COVID um, uh, between the different groups of people, like the very elderly or the very young. Everyone recognized this is horrible. And so reasonable people work together. It also helped that we had a much more, more cohesive culture. There's a lot more public trust. And that's what my point is about reasonableness. This is only going to work if people are reasonable and that there's already built up trust. Of course, in a totalitarian leaning situation, that's not usually the case. Okay. Also, uh, along with Burden of proof is competency. So those who have the vocation to deal with a particular issue should be given proper honor and deference. So this kind of ties into the expert thing before. I'm not dumping on expertise. If there's an issue of public health and safety, should we talk to the doctors and the virologists? Absolutely. However, it's an important point that authorities or experts do not have a monopoly on competency. They don't. They don't have a monopoly on it. Just because I'm not a medical professional doesn't mean that I can't see after months and months of the coronavirus that this isn't the Black Plague. I don't need a degree to recognize that. I can do simple math. And if we aren't willing to admit uh, that, that this is true, they don't have a monopoly on competency, then we will fall into the cult of experts. You might as well get rid of voters' assemblies too, because who's, who's the expert? Who went to school? Who has the degree? Yeah, the pastor. But we don't believe that, right? We understand that all Christians do have maybe not as much competency a, as the pastor, but they have brains, they understand the Ten Commandments, and that in exceptional circumstances, if you have a pastor who's teaching heresy, what do you got to do? You got to stop him. You got to stop him. I mean, if we give, if we say that the experts and the, the official authorities have a monopoly on competency, then get rid of the Reformation, right? Get rid of it. Because the popes and the cardinals and everybody else said, Luther, you're wrong. Okay, yes, sir. You're the boss. So that's an important point. They don't have a monopoly on competency. Okay, um, Luther expresses this when he talks about um, in uh, whether soldiers too may be saved about fighting an unjust war. He writes, suppose my Lord were wrong in going to war. I reply, uh, this is a soldier asking this question. I reply, if you know for sure that he is wrong, then you should fear God rather than men. Acts 4. And not fight or serve, for you cannot have a good conscience before God. But if you do not know or cannot find out whether your Lord is wrong, you ought not to weaken certain obedience for the sake of an uncertain justice. Rather, you should think the best of your Lord, as is the way of love, for love believes all things and does not think evil. So who's the burden of proof on? The soldier, right? But Luther also acknowledges the exception. If you know your overlord is asking you to fight an unjust war, you should forbid or you should reject being commanded to sin. But if you're uncertain, what do you do? You default to the general rule. You obey your superior. Let's, oh, well, I already jumped ahead to this. Luther versus the papacy. I, I love how, I love how uh, 
Luther says this in the small card articles, because of course the papacy was the, the cult of experts, right? You, you, you people can't understand these things. You don't know what's going on. Here is all of our uh, canon law and our councils and things like that. But Luther says, thank God a seven-year-old child knows what the, whole, what the church is, namely the holy believers and lambs who hear the voice of their shepherd. So maybe if you line up Luther on one side with the people who agreed with him versus the Catholic hierarchy, sure, you're going to have more doctorates, you're going to have more um, higher learning, but at the end of the day, who's right and who's wrong? The person who agrees with scripture. And Luther's point is, is that even a seven-year-old child listening to the voice of his shepherd through the Holy Word is going to know it better than a pope who's tyrannically taking all of this authority against the word of God. Or uh, Walther, and I kind of got to this with voters assemblies, the judgment of the sheep over their shepherds. When Christ calls upon his hearers to beware of false prophets and know the true from the false prophets by their fruits, he seats all hearers on the throne of judgment, giving the balances of truth into their hands and commands them to judge their teacher confidently. Now, again, the norm is what? You respect the preacher of the word. You trust him. You believe the words that he says. But the exception is he's not speaking like the Bible. He's not teaching in accordance with the word of God. Well, I'm sorry. I just got to trust the science, right? <laughs> no, you don't just trust the science or the, uh, the, you know, the exegetical theology that he's pulling out of somewhere. No, you say, no, I am going to follow the word of God. I don't pretend to have the same knowledge as the quote unquote expert, but the clear word of God says this. So the rule versus the exception. Um, here's, uh, here's Luther again. And this is from his Genesis commentary and it, and it gets to the rule versus exception. And um, Romans 13 is in the background here. If the government tolerates me when I teach the word, I hold it in honor and regard it with all respect as my superior. But if, I, but if it says deny God, cast the word aside, then I no longer acknowledge it as the government. In the same way, one must render obedience to one's parents. But if they say, I want you to become a monk or a priest devoted to papal idolatry, then one should by no means obey it. God wants us to deny ourselves in our life in the second table, if it is contrary to the first. But if they are in agreement, then reverence for parents is reverence for God. If on the other hand, they conflict with one another, each other, then an exception is necessary. And then Luther deals with the question. But is it proper and necessary to state that the government, parents, and every authority must be obeyed? It is proper. The question is, why does Roman 13 say what it says if you're saying there's an exception? Well, Luther says, of course, it's proper to make the general rule. I, re I acquiesce to the rule, he says. Well, then why do you not observe the law if either the government or your parents demand that you follow their religion? I answer, this is an exception. The first table must be given precedence over the second table. If parents prescribe or command something contrary to the word of God, then the fourth commandment, which previously was valid and unalterable, is abrogated. We must obey God rather than man. We see this also in on temporal authority. Luther responded to the news that princes loyal to the papacy were ordering evangelical believers to give up their copies of the scriptures. Uh, and Luther's hilarious in this. Now tell me, how much wit must there be in the head of a person who imposes commands in an area where he has no authority whatsoever? Would you not judge the person insane who commanded the moon to shine whenever he wanted it to? How well would it go if the Leipzigers were to impose laws on us Wittenbergers? Or if, conversely, we in Wittenberg were to legislate for the people of Leipzig? I mean, it's kind of like uh, ordering toddlers to wear masks and thinking it will make any difference when it's like this and they're snotting and touching everyone. I mean, that, I mean, it's crazy because it will not help at all. It's like ordering the moon to shine. Yet our, uh, they would certainly send the lawmakers a thank offering of hellbore to purge their brains and to cure their stifles. Yet our emperor and clever princes are doing just that today. They are allowing Pope, Bishop, and Sophists to lead them on, one blind man leading the other, to command their subjects to believe without God's word, whatever they please. And still they would be known as Christian princes. God forbid. I know my time's short. Here in te on temporal authority, Luther is rejecting the actions of the rulers who are trying to strip Bibles 
from evangelical Lutheran Christians on two grounds. And it's important for us to recognize both grounds. You, a, a lot of times people will say, well, I will disobey the government only if they forbid the preaching of the gospel or they command me to sin, right? But I think sometimes people forget about there's, there's not just illegal orders, but there's illegitimate orders that aren't necessarily immoral. How many times did people say, well, why won't you obey the government that tells you to wear a mask? There's nothing immoral about wearing a mask. Well, okay, but that's not exactly the point. Uh, point one, civil authorities cannot rule over an inward spiritual matter. That's Luther's point about, the, uh, uh, about them taking away the Bibles, such as personal faith. This is outside of their jurisdiction. Just like if the government uh, would say to me, you must force your children to wear bike helmets when they're riding around in your driveway. Uh, no, I don't actually. And not because I think that wearing a bike helmet is immoral. Well, maybe, no, I'm joking. But it's not that I think wearing a bike helmet is immoral. In some cases, it's, it's a very smart thing to do if you're mountain biking or traveling across country. But I, it's, it's not that I think that it's intrinsically immoral, but it's that I don't recognize the local government's authority to slap that ordinance on me and my household. So that's illegitimate orders. Um, that's Luther's point about like the Wittenbergers trying to command the Leipzigers. It, it's just illegitimate. That's not your office. It's not your jurisdiction. Two, the Lord instituted and rules over all authorities. So civil authorities or any other authorities, for that matter, are by definition, not only outside of their jurisdiction, but seek to command something wicked when they attempt to rule in contradiction to God's word or natural law. That makes it not just illegitimate because you, you can't be properly within your office, in your jurisdiction, if you're commanding something evil. So if you step out of your office and it's also immoral, not only are you giving illegitimate orders, but illegal orders. And uh, anyone in the United States military knows that if you're given an illegal order, what do you do? You disobey it. That's not only by nature what you should do, but it's explicitly taught by what? Military Code of Justice? I don't know. I can't quote a chapter and verse, but it's there. I think this is a good place to stop. I know I'm out of time anyway, but also because we're going to get into some examples to flesh this out when we come back.